Yeah, I think I'll get started. So uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Ariel Rokem and I am at University of Washington in Seattle and uh, together with uh, Talia Arconi who will introduce himself, uh, I'm the co-organizer of Neuro Academy and we'd like to welcome you to Neuro Academy 2020, Tal. Hi, I'm Talia Arconi, I'm uh, at the uh, University of Texas at Austin and I am the sub-director which means I, in, in principle, I'm co-director, but in practice, I all does all the work and I take half the credit, which works out very nicely for me, but I'm delighted that you're all here. So welcome to NeuroAcademy 2020. First of all, I'd like to say that I really wish you were all here. Uh, this is Seattle. This is the view out my window uh, this morning um, as I open my eyes uh, here. Uh, but this is not what we're doing this year. Um, what is NeuroAcademy? NeuroAcademy is a summer institute in neuroimaging and data science. It's a mixture of things. It's a summer school uh, where we try to teach certain things, and I'll talk about that in a minute. It's a bit of an unconference. I'll tell you what that is in just a second as well. And we mix in a bit of a hackathon as well. And this is the fifth time that we've done NeuroAcademy. Uh, but it's the first time that we're doing Neuro Academy in this format. And because this time we're doing it in this format, we decided to open it up to many of you. And um, I hope that uh, many of you are joining us this morning and will join us for many of the talks and will stay engaged through this week. Uh, because it's the first time that we're doing it in this remote format, we don't quite know how things are going to go. And part of this is a bit of an experiment to see whether this format translates well to uh, remote format. Um, and we hope it does, and we'll, we'll make an effort to make it so. Um, really, NeuroAcademy was originally inspired by the idea of brain hacks. Uh, brain hacks, for uh, those of you who have never attended a brain hack before, are also a combination of things. There's an educational component of training um, where less experienced attendees learn basic software and data analysis skills through live lectures and tutorials. And we do those kinds of things at NeuroAcademy as well. Uh, there's a component of unconference where people um, uh, get together to talk about things. There are presentations, there might be panel content, and that can be organized both by the organizers of the event, but also on site by attendees who want to do different things with each other uh, to come together and, and self-organize. And we encourage you to do that uh, here as well, and we'll try to facilitate that. And then the final component is a hackathon. Um, people get together and collaborate on projects uh, throughout the event, and we'll have dedicated time for really just the hackathon and unconference on, on Friday, because the schedule before that is, is, pretty, um, is pretty full. Um, I'd just like to mention this. Well, what is, what is this hacking thing? Where does it come from? Um, there's a long tradition of hacking and I'm basing here on um, a book by Stephen Levy about hackers who wrote mostly about the hacker culture that developed around MIT in the 1950s and 1960s when computers were very young and people started getting their hands on them. Um, the hacker ethos is based on the so-called hands-on imperative, the idea that you do things yourself, you try things out and experiment. An important component of the hacker ethos is sharing. And we believe very much in the idea of sharing uh, that information should be free, that um, you know, the scientific context, uh, data and analysis should be free and shared. Um, the hacker ethos uh, mistrusts authority and promotes decentralization. Um, I hope that this event will be <laughs> fully decentralized so that you all take part in it. Um, the original hacker ethos had all this stuff about meritocracy. Uh, we're going to just uh, strike that over and uh, promote instead inclusivity, the idea that we should include people from many different backgrounds, many different places. Um, and, you know, in, in the scientific context, again, people from different fields and different interests and uh, with different ideas about how to do things. Um, you know, for me, the, the next point is that you can create beautiful things with computers is more replaced with the idea that you can play around with things, that you can play around with ideas and with computers and, and derive joy out of that. 
Um, and in the hacker ethos, this is the, the idea that you can create things that are just meant to be as they are. And computers can change your life for the better. Uh, we hope that through the things that you learn with us, um, your life will uh, be better if only for this week, but maybe also beyond as well. Um, okay, and in the scientific context, the context again, the the one of the goals of Neuroacademy is um, the, to take the hacker ethos and meet uh, what was you know sometimes called the reproducibility crisis but I'll actually call it the reproducibility renaissance. The idea of reproducibility was built into science from very long ago. This is you know, the, the um, sort of logo of the uh, Royal Academy, uh, Royal Society. And, and you know, the, 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 the motto there is uh, nullius in verba is don't believe, don't take anyone by their word. You need to check their work and you need to see the evidence. And, uh, for us in, in the modern scientific context where data sets are very large, analyses are very, very complicated, reproducibility becomes challenging. Uh, but I think that the field of neuroscience and science in general has really engaged with reproducibility in the last few years and thinking about what reproducibility means and what we need to do in order to promote reproducibility. And for us, um, Neuroacademy is an opportunity to talk about reproducibility, to talk about the practices, the tools, uh, that exists to promote reproducibility in, in neuroscience and, and human uh, neuroimaging. Um, another sort of context of neuroacademy is this, uh, what I call the era of brain observatories. Uh, we're now, um, we now have access to more data than we've ever had before uh, through, uh, and a lot of it is through large scale uh, consortia who are collecting data sets and producing data sets and providing these data sets openly uh, to us, um, examples of that are the Human Connectome Project uh, that produced the data and also is sharing the data, or Open Neuro that collects a lot of data and provides that data in an open, uh, openly available way. Uh, the challenge of the era of brain observatories is that we now need um, tools and practices to um, meet these data sets where they are and address the, the large dimensionality and the huge complexity of these data sets. So we need data intensive methods, um, we need open source software to analyze the data, and we need to start engaging in you know, team science and in new ways of collaborating with these large scale open data sets. So in terms of data intensive methods, you're going to hear a lot about machine learning in the lectures that are in this week, and also a lot about statistics. But that's not the only thing that data intensive methods are. Usually a lot of the time when people think about data, data science and data intensive methods, machine learning is immediately what they think about. Uh, but for us, data intensive methods also um, comprise of data management, data visualization, workflows, ways to collaborate um, in data analysis and so on. So that's going to be a pretty big emphasis of this, of this week as well. And then uh, open source software, um, we are unabashedly Python centric and we uh, really try to focus on Python as the main open source uh, tool and the tool from which uh, many of the tools that we use derive. Uh, there are sort of three different levels to think about that. The first is really the use of Python in neuroimaging and neuroscience. Uh, there's a larger ecosystem within this which this um, uh, work exists, which is the largest scientific Python, SciPy, and data analysis, PyData uh, ecosystems of software within which we do our work, and we, we benefit from that work as well. And then finally, a uh, uh, third thing to think about is just the, the broader context of how um, we exist and, and uh, how we interact in academia with, with others. For example, the role that Python now plays as a, as a software uh, programming language in, in industry. So I'll start really with that. Uh, so this is the IEEE Spectrum Programming Language Ranking for 2020. And Python has been at the, at the top of this ranking for several years. Uh, IEEE Spectrum puts this programming language ranking together based on a lot of different things. Google searches, uh, but also um, job ads and what um, um, jobs exist for uh, people who program in different languages within industry. And then the, the kinds of things that people are doing with, with those uh, programming languages. And, and Python is just a very useful programming language um, in, the, in the industry context and 
arguably also in the scientific context. So this is the scientific context that I mentioned. Um, the work that we do with Python um, in, in neuroscience and neuroimaging exists within a broader context. So this is a, a slide from Jake Vanderplas's uh, keynote talk at the PyCon conference in 2017. So if you think of Python as being in the center of this universe, um, what has been built over the years is a whole ecosystem of tools. So the lowest layer here are tools that are um, not specific to any particular data analysis or science field, uh, but really are general purpose tools. These are tools like NumPy, which provides uh, numerical computing tools. And, and you, you can learn about uh, NumPy in, in one of the tutorials this week. And then other tools for uh, high performance computing, for interactive computing. Then on top of that, there's another layer of tools that are more data analysis centric, but still are agnostic to the specific uh, field. They're tools for visualization like matplotlib, um, tools for organizing data and analyzing it, um, tools like SciPy that do specific um, numerical computing uh, routines that are, are used in science. On top of that, uh, people have organized and written um, libraries of specific analysis routines for, for example, image processing, for analysis of networks, for analysis, statistical analysis or machine learning. And then finally, at the top layer here are many, many, many libraries that exist nowadays to analyze specific kinds of data. So NiPy is, stands for neuroimaging in Python. I'll just highlight DiPy because I work on it. That is specifically for diffusion imaging in Python and computational neuroanatomy. And then in many other fields, there's uh, AstroPy for astronomy and SunPy for analysis of images of the sun and BioPython and biology and so on and so forth in, in many, many different fields. And what's nice about this ecosystem is that um, we benefit from not only the fact that things come up the, up the chain here, but also things can feed back to the central, uh, more central projects. And we benefit from network interactions between different projects where we can uh, borrow ideas, we can borrow practices, and we can borrow code from each other. And the fact that all this is done openly through very permissive licenses that allow you to use the code in whatever way you want, um, we really can benefit uh, very quickly and rapidly um, from these tools and these tools can uh, develop as, as communities of practice. Um, just mentioning Python and neuroimaging, uh, one way to think about how Python has taken hold within neuroimaging is in looking at uh, different statistical measures of this. This is from a paper that uh, Russ Poldrak, Chris Gorgulowski, and uh, Gail Burko, all speakers at NeuroAcademy, incidentally, wrote in 2019. And one of the things that, that they mentioned within this paper that really is about data intensive methods in neuroimaging is really the, the role that Python is uh, taking in uh, neuroimaging. So this is uh, one metric you could look at is the fraction of Google searches for tutorials, um, comparing here MATLAB and, and Python and really just the immense rise in the, the search for uh, Python tutorials in the last five, 10 years maybe. Uh, another way to look at that is look really at citation uh, metrics, look at uh, counts of mentions of Python or MATLAB within um, articles in, in PubMed. Here, what you see is really a rise of software in general, just the fact that writing software is important and uh, this kind of uh, hockey stick growth in, in the mentions of, of Python in, in PubMed. And then finally, more specifically, even in Python, just looking at a uh, number of fMRI publications that mention different tools. Again, you see a growth across the board of different tools that are mentioned, uh, but a particular growth in Python, even though it's um, still relatively low to other tools like uh, SPM or FSL that are mentioned uh, more often. Um, but we really believe that Python is a good tool uh, for us to teach in the context of NeuroAcademy because it's a great tool for hacking. It's a tool that is relatively easy to pick up and also um, relatively powerful. So you can, you can go pretty far with it. You can start going pretty fast and then go pretty far with it. And so that's why we teach Python in this context and why we really focus on the Python ecosystem for, for data analysis. And then in the context of uh, one of the other things that I mentioned, team science um, will really emphasize uh, methods for collaborative software development and analysis. You'll learn methods of these sorts uh, throughout this, this workshop, uh, throughout NeuroAcademy. 
Um, we'll, we'll talk a lot about methods and considerations in sharing of research products, sharing data, sharing code, how you share software with other people. And then um, Neuroacademy itself provides a space to safely experiment with team science, form connections with other people and um, hack together with them on projects and see that team science can be fun, it can be productive, it can be useful. Um, wait, what is going on? Isn't this Neuromatch Academy? Uh, so just one thing, uh, there was a little bit of what's called in software a namespace collision issue that happened over the last couple of months. While we were organizing this workshop, um, there was another workshop getting organized called Neuromatch Academy. It's off by just a few letters and words uh, I should mention that's not where you are right now, if that's where you intend and, to be. And we are suing them because we were here first. So don't worry, yeah, we'll, the, get this, we'll get this straightened that, out. There will be no Neuromatch Academy next year, so there will be no competition. I should mention that we're similar in some respects. We do these broadcasts where we talk about different things. And I think uh, the Neuromatch Academy is also very focused on computational tools, but there's a slight sort of difference in emphasis. Our focus is primarily on human neuroscience. Um, and by human neuro neuroscience, I mean the kinds of experiments that we do with human participants. Um, really, a lot of our focus is going to be on MRI methods, although there will be other methods mentioned here as well, electrophysiology methods that are used in, in humans as well. Um, our focus, I would say, is more on technical and myth mythological issues than what was focused in Neuromatch Academy. And really the focus on hacking, uh, the focus on you all getting organizing together to do things uh, together with each other. We're going to try to facilitate that. Uh, we think it's a little bit more open-ended, but so it's a bit more of a risk, but it can be uh, a lot of fun to self-organize in that way. And we, we hope that you really engage with that opportunity as well. And we'll talk a little bit about the ways, the ways we'll, we're going to try to do that. Okay. Who, who do we think you are? So who we, we assume and uh, think is the target audience uh, for, this, uh, for this event. Um, as mentioned on our website, we expect some experiment, experience with neuroscience, some experience with neuroscience data, uh, some knowledge of the, the nervous system. We're, we don't have intentionally, we don't have uh, any lectures that are introductory lectures to neuroscience and neuroscience ideas. Um, and so we hope that a lot of you have some experience with neuroscience. And then the other thing that we hope, expect that you have experience with is some experience with programming. And by that, I mean that you, you've done a little bit of programming in, in your research, in your, in your work, and, and you're sort of familiar with ideas from pro basic ideas from programming. I should say, we don't necessarily expect that you have experience with programming in Python. And, and one of the lectures today is going to be, or one of the tutorials later today is going to be an introduction to Python. But the introduction to Python is also uh, set at a level, assuming that you've already programmed in some programming language or you have some familiarity with programming and that you can sort of uh, uh, now learn how to, to use Python. And we hope many of you will, will do that. Um, the, the slide also says the imposter syndrome disclaimer, just to remind me to tell you that um, this kind of context of a, a workshop like this or a, an event like this is an event where you look around and you notice other people and you talk to other people or you communicate with other people over Slack and you learn about what they're doing and you might feel like, oh, this is not necessarily the right place for me. I don't know all these things that these other people know. And I'm just here to reassure you that despite what I just told you about our expectations, you're probably in the right place. If, if you have some experience with neuroscience and some experience with programming, you're in the right place and we think that you can a, pick up the things that we will be talking about and, and teaching you throughout this week. And also that you're, you're ready to start hacking. You will be ready to start hacking with others. Uh, part of hacking is uh, working with others and teaching other people and learning from other people. That's really, um, for me, a main goal in, in hackathons is to learn new things and teach other people. And so um, even if you feel like you don't necessarily know all the things you need to know in order to start hacking. You don't have ideas about what you would do in a hack project. Um, stick with us. Don't uh, believe your own imposter syndrome. And just to add to that also, I mean, do keep in mind that, you know, there's, I think, something like 1,400 people registered for this. And it's inevitable that um, any particular talk 
will assume certain things, right? And so there may be things you don't understand in some, some lectures. There may be things that, you know, you start watching, you think like, well, I know all this, I, you know, I've learned it eight times, I don't need to watch this. Um, so just be aware that, you know, we're, we're trying to cater to a fairly wide range of people, but, but don't be surprised if some things either seem difficult or too easy. Um, and just to really reiterate something Ariel said, um, like programming is hard, right? And so even if you're pretty new, it might be like even in like some of the introductory um, tutorials, there might be concepts that are hard. Don't be surprised at all if you're new and you find yourself having to spend, you know, hours to get something. That, that's something that pretty much with some rare exceptions some very lucky people, pretty much everyone has to go through this process of like banging your head against the wall. So that's part of it, right? You, there's no, like, you're not going to learn to program or learn your imaging in like three hours. And you probably know that, but just to make sure, like, frustration is part and parcel of it for everyone. So that, that should be expected. Okay, so what's going to happen uh, in the next few days? So here's the schedule. I've copied it over from our website. So you can go to neuroacademy.org and, and see the schedule, but I'll, I'll sort of walk you through the different things that will happen over the, the course of the next few days. So we're right here at 7 a.m. Uh, all times on this schedule are Pacific, US Pacific times, which is my time zone. So I, I just made it easy for me to know when things are happening. But on the other hand, everything is starting really early in the morning for me. Um, so we're going to have a talk by Russ Poldrack next, setting sort of the stage for thinking about reproducibility in fMRI. And um, after Russ's talk, Tal will talk about ethics in neuroimaging and data science. We think this is a really important, uh, really important thing to discuss in the context of data science and um, something that we think that we as a community should think about more and more. The next thing that will happen is an icebreaker. So we'll have an opportunity. We've uh, uh, created uh, um, an opportunity for us all to sort of mingle a little bit through something called Gather Town. Uh, some of you might have attended uh, the recent uh, Organization for Human Brain Mapping OHBM conference. And during that conference that was also held remotely, there were several opportunities to interact with other participants through this website. Um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more information about that and how we do this icebreaker. And it'll just be an opportunity for all of us to interact with each other through this weird virtual platform that will let us um, navigate and meet each other. So um, I'll, I'll tell you about that. And then in the, in the afternoon, um, we'll have two tutorials going on in parallel. So in many of these uh, time slots, you'll see that there are two things happening in parallel and you'll have to choose what you do live and what you might catch up with later, and that depends a little bit on your background and what you're interested in. Uh, Tal will be teaching an introduction to programming Python that I just mentioned, but if you already know Python and feel very comfortable with Python, and you'd like to learn a little bit about high performance tools in Python, then I'll be teaching in parallel uh, this high performance in Python um, tutorial focusing on a few tools that you can use in order to accelerate the performance of Python. And then in, uh, at two, the, the last talk of today will be a talk given by Fernando Perez. Uh, Fernando Perez um, um, created the, the Jupyter project and he'll talk about uh, general tools uh, for interactive exploratory data analysis uh, for reproducibility. Um, so this day forms sort of a, a part of the introduction to various things. Tomorrow we will have in the morning, uh, again, two different things. One is version control with Git and GitHub. Uh, if you're not familiar with Git and GitHub as tools for version control, I'd really recommend going to that. But if you are familiar with that and Git and GitHub are tools that you use every day, in parallel, you can learn about Docker, uh, which is a tool for uh, virtualization, um, containerization and deployment of consistent uh, computational environments. Uh, so you can choose among those. Uh, at nine, there'll be, again, um, two tutorials, data manipulation in Python, which is more introductory, and then uh, creating shareable Python libraries, which I will give, which is more about if you already write Python and you know how to write uh, data analysis in Python, how do you go from the data analysis to a library that you can share with others and publish and, and so on. Um, and then um, following that, there'll be two tutorials, again, an introduction to machine learning, uh, this one will be very focused on, on code uh, with uh, the scikit-learn library. And then a data visualization Python parallel uh, given by Christy Whitaker. Uh, in the afternoon, we'll have two talks again uh, in parallel, meta-analysis and reproducibility by Angie Laird, and then uh, another talk that uh, 
relates to machine learning, uh, the difference between prediction and explanation by Jeanette Mumford, this one will be more, of, will give more of a theoretical uh, approach to machine learning. Okay, Wednesday morning, um, seven and nine uh, are four talks on a variety of tools um, for analysis of neuroimaging data, really focusing now on a variety of things. Uh, Satra Ghosh will talk about workflows and about NightPipe tools for putting together workflows and pipelines for data analysis. Uh, Chris Markevich will talk about uh, Nibabble, which is a tool for uh, reading and writing data and file structures in Python for a variety of neuroimaging file formats. Um, uh, Elizabeth Dupree will, um, uh, which I should mention also will uh, uh, introduce Get and Get Up tomorrow, uh, will we'll give uh, tutorials on NeLearn that is a library for machine learning on neuroimaging in particular. And um, Oscar Esteban will uh, talk about NePreps, which is uh, a whole uh, kind of ecosystem for tools for pre-processing of neuroimaging data. Eleven will have one talk, uh, and this talk is about the brain imaging data structure. This is a format for sharing um, data and, and organizing data such that other people can uh, in, uh, use it and uh, sort of a standard for um, data sharing. And uh, Christy Whitaker will present that. In the afternoon, we'll have, uh, again, two tutorials in parallel. One will be more focused on electrophysiology data. This will be given by Liberty Hamilton. And then Nora Benson will talk about uh, geometry and structure and an analysis of geometry and structure in, in human brain data. In, in the afternoon, again, two talks in parallel. One will be uh, by Alex Huth. We'll uh, focus on word embeddings as prior for language encoding models of uh, um, uh, brain data. And then uh, another talk about uh, reproducibility. Uh, here, uh, more focused on statistical issues in reproducibility by uh, J.D. Pauline. Um, on uh, Thursday morning, we'll have uh, one talk from Gael Verko, again, giving a survey of machine learning for neuroimaging. As I told you, there'll be a lot of machine learning going on. Um, you'll see that there will probably be some overlap between some of these talks but I, I believe that there will also be uh, new ideas introduced in every one of these. Uh, at 9 a.m., uh, you can hear about uh, functional brain parcellation from Pierre Belek, or about cloud computing for neuroimaging from Tara Diasta, Amanda Tan, and myself. At 11 a.m., we will have a panel discussion. Uh, Chris Gorgolowski, Anisha Keshevan, and Chris Chatham are all people who um, got their training uh, during neuroscience and were neuroscience researchers and are now doing a variety of different uh, things in industry. And um, we'll hear from them what their path was like and uh, what they're doing nowadays, in what ways they're using things that they learned mm, through their academic training and what things they wish they had learned in their academic training. Um, in the afternoon, we'll have um, two tutorials, uh, one about testing and accounting for confounding variables, this is by Manjuri uh, Narayan. And in parallel, a tutorial on optimization by uh, Sasha Rabkin, Prasanna Raut, uh, Kelsey Mas, and uh, Mariam Fazel. Um, later in the afternoon, we'll have another tutorial. I'll, I'll explain what ADSI means. ADSI is, uh, is a particular thing that I'll explain in just a second. Um, another tutorial from ADSI about optimal transport methods. These are statistical methods for comparing distributions. In parallel to that, uh, you can hear from Eva Dyer about aligning neural recordings across time, space, and behavior. Um, I should say these, these two uh, talks uh, are probably going to approach very similar kinds of topics. Uh, so really, if you, watch one, if you watch one of these live, I'd recommend everyone also watching the other one uh, as a compliment. This will be really a hands-on introduction to optimal transport. And then uh, Eva, I believe, will show really how you use it, optimal transport in, in uh, analysis of uh, neural data. Okay, and on Friday at 7 a.m., we'll get together here and Tal and I will walk you through Brain Hacking 101, which will sort of set off the, the day and we hope that it'll continue through the day, um, the whole day of, of brain hacking together. So there's nothing here on the schedule, but that just means that we're all gonna try to do together. Um, we'll, we'll try to hack together. So this is the schedule. Um, so at this point, you might be asking yourself, okay, so what's happening on it during that hackathon. So the idea is uh, we would like you to self-organize in the following way. Um, we have on Slack uh, a channel devoted to project pitches. The idea is we want you to write a short summary 
of um, what you think you might do during that day, you can all actually start discussing and started getting together with others during the entire week and start working on projects. But really that Friday will be entirely devoted to that. Um, in addition to the project pitches channel, we have a, an interactive document where you can write, we have a template. Uh, maybe I'll actually just show this. Um, here we go. Um, so we're here. Um, people are already, let me show the project pitches. This is alphabetically organized. So here's project pitches. So here's the project pitches channel and there are already some people have um, pitched some project ideas. At the top here, there is a link to a document and this document uh, contains at the top a template. So you copy this template here and then um, copy it down and start writing uh, you know, your title, goals, a description of what you want to do, who's the contact person, what that person's Slack handle is, and we'd like you to create a channel for uh, your project. So um, in Slack, you can create channels by clicking on this plus and hitting create channels. So feel free to create channels and announce them into the general channel or on a variety of different uh, things, um, topics, interest groups, and so on. Um, so you, you'll pitch, pitch these projects and then hopefully people will uh, aggregate into these Slack channels and start discussing these, these project pitches throughout the week. And then uh, on uh, Friday, you can, you can work together. Uh, the way that I would propose working together more uh, closely is to create a, a video chat um, for your project. Uh, one way to create a video chat that anyone can join and a video chat that anyone can create is using a website called Jitsi. Um, we'll post the link to that. If you create a Jitsi, you can post that into your, uh, the channel for your, um, your, the Slack channel for your project. And then um, you can meet up there and talk to people face to face, assuming the groups won't be ginormous. Uh, that can be a, a good way to interact and, and organize. What makes a good project? I think what makes a good project in my opinion is uh, that it includes a component of something that new that you would like to learn from this. Uh, something that interests you, but maybe it's not exactly what you do in your day to day. Um, something that uh, uses open resources, maybe open data or open software. A good project can be an opportunity to learn about a new tool or to explore a new data set that you're interested in. It should be something that you can approach and start getting going pretty quickly. So if your project, if the project that you have in mind will require extensive pre-processing of some data for four days, then that's probably not a great project uh, for a hackathon. Uh, but if the data is already available and openly uh, accessible um, and you'd like to analyze it, uh, this, this could be the, the start for the, the hackathon project. And then, you know, bring in other people. Um, find your um, uh, uh, people who are interested in things that uh, complement what you're interested in. This is a, really an opportunity to interact with other people. And then another thing that you can do in the hackathon is convene a boff. A boff is a birds of a feather session. Uh, so find a time, create a Jitsi video chat, and get together to discuss a particular topic of interest. If you are interested in diffusion MRI, maybe you'd like to hold a, a boff on diffusion MRI. If you're interested in spinal cord imaging, maybe you'd like to find all the people here who are interested in spinal cord imaging and get all those people together in the BOF. Um, so uh, in the BOF channel, you can announce the BOF, announce when it will be. Uh, please take into account different time zones so that it's uh, convenient for uh, a lot of people. We're aware that it's hard to meet all the time zones, but early in the morning Pacific time is, um, is pretty convenient in much of North America, South America, Europe, and even in parts of Asia. Okay. Throughout this whole event, how do you get help? Well, uh, we'll have Q&A during each session in the way that we have Q&A here. So there's a, a Q&A window. And uh, right now I saw that Tal is sort of taking some of the questions, but I'll also take questions here later on. Um, and the idea is that instructors in, in the different tutorials and lectures. We'll, we'll pause to take questions throughout their uh, lectures. Uh, we have dedicated session channels. So 
Um, for example, for this particular session here, we have this channel here. Um, you can join the channels by clicking on this plus sign in Slack and then browsing the channels and then entering the name of the channels. For example, Monday introduction. Uh, well, you can browse all the channels here. So find all the Monday channels here. Um, so for example, I can join this one here by clicking on that. And you can all join that now if you want. Um, so we have we have channels that are dedicated. I've joined all of them, so they're all here on my on my Slack. Um, but uh, the sessions that you plan to attend, please do join the Slack channels for those uh, for those uh, sessions. Um, we are also going to direct you to another um, venue to ask questions and have discussions, which is Neurostars. Neurostars is a, a website. Uh, for questions and answers on uh, neuroscience. And we have a so-called a category. Here's our category. If you go to neurostars.org slash C slash neuroacademy, then it'll bring you to this page. And you can create new topics on this page. Um, how do I create a new topic? And then you can ask here, someone please demonstrate. There we go. And that created a new topic here, I believe. Uh, I hope. I'm not seeing what happened here. Okay, something might have happened there that prevented that from happening. I have too many things, including my view here. Oh, you must include at least a tag, sorry. And at least one tag needs to be included, sorry. Um, help. No. Okay, we'll have to, seems like I can't do that. So, um, what, what are parent tags? Okay. Aha, and by adding the Neuroacademy 2020 tag, I was finally able to um, add that question. And uh, we will post uh, special topics for every one of the lectures, and those will be venues to continue the discussion. But you should feel free to post questions about any of the topics that will come up. Um, take charge, self-organize, find other ways to get help from each other, from us, and so on. We're really open to any suggestions. Okay, one more thing that is going to facilitate our interactions throughout this week is our Jupyter Hub. So at hub.neuroacademy.org, we've set up a computational system that you can log into using your GitHub credentials uh, to perform a variety of different computations. Once you approve the app for use by GitHub, and please do approve the app for use by GitHub, you'll see a, a menu much like this one that gives you different options for the server. And per default, it's set to small. And please do use the small unless the instructor of the session that you're in tells you that this session requires a larger amount of memory. Please do use the small amount of memory for that. Um, you start it like this. You'll see something like this happening. And uh, you should be redirected automatically to the hub when it's ready for you. If a lot of people log in together, as might be happening right now, <clears throat> then it might take a little while. And so one thing that I'm going to ask you to do uh, right now and over the course of the next, um, so this is, this is our back end for analytics to see how many people are logging in. And indeed, a lot of you are logging in right now, which is great. Um, I'll, I'll ask you to log in actually uh, now and because this takes time and so that you are ready to go by the time that we actually need the hub. In, in a couple of hours, please do log in right now so that our server gets you into the queue and gets you into uh, this system. And while this is starting up, I'm just going to look at the, this uh, curve again. So this, this here is the number of users coming in. 
I'll correct me if I'm wrong too. I think it will also log you out after like 30 minutes of inactivity or something like that. Is that right? I, I, I'm so, not sure about the exact okay. number of minutes. Well, there, I think it's, at some point it will. So just be aware that you know if you're if you're you think you have it open and you're planning to just sit down and start using it, just you might want to check maybe a little while before the, uh, the talk tutorial begins, just to make sure that you don't need to fire it up again. Yeah, so show up at the hub a few minutes before the tutorial starts. So let's say today at noon, there's a tutorial. There are two tutorials that will require this hub. Uh, please show up a few minutes before that and just kind of log in and see that everything is working. There's one folder in here. So the, the way this works is there is a plus here that allows you to open things like Jupyter Notebooks. And we'll tell you more about Jupyter Notebooks later today. Um, in the curriculum folder, all the materials for the various sessions will start showing up. This is automatically populated um, as we update the materials throughout this week. Uh, these are automatically updated, but I can point, for example, to my tutorial today. Uh, if you click on that, it'll show the materials and you can follow along with me as I'm running uh, different parts of these, uh, these tutorials. And we'll show that to you later today, how this, this works exactly during the tutorials themselves. Just wanted to highlight that here and recommend that you go and check that out, log in, see that everything works uh, now before the, the tutorials uh, start. And actually just maybe to clarify that um, the Jupyter tutorial is part of the Python tutorial. So that does mean that if you're planning to, to watch the high performance Python tutorial in live, which I definitely recommend if you have a little bit of Python background. Uh, but all that means is you might then want to maybe check out the slides or just watch the, the first part of the Python story later, which will be the Jupyter part, which will be like 10 minutes probably. Yep. And, and Fernando will also talk about uh, Jupyter uh, in the talk this afternoon as well and tell you a lot about the motivation for this system and how it works with other systems and so on. Okay. Um, we're not all together in the same place, but I hope that this is also a social event. You'll meet people, you'll interact with them, and you'll get to know them. Uh, there are a few things that we need to keep in mind. Um, first of all is um, that um, this event, like I said, is a social event, and um, social events need to have some kind of guidelines for how they organize themselves so that everyone has a good a good time. And we have a code of conduct that explains what are the kinds of guidelines, behaviors that we expect in this event. Um, um, the, the, the document is, is linked from uh, the, uh, I've shared it on Slack and uh, I'll, I'll send that link again later today. Um, I'll just highlight the, and you can, you can look at the, the entire document, it's, it's a few pages. I'll just mention the few community guidelines at the top that um, I think we should mention in, you know, up front, uh, we expect you not to harass people and harassment includes, of course, physical contact is out of the question, but sexual attention and repeated social contact can be engaged through uh, Slack and through other methods. And, and we expect that you, you refrain from, from harassment, uh, be respectful of others, and that means not engaging in, in a variety of exclusionary and disrespectful behavior, um, homophobic, racist, transphobic, ageist, ableist, sexist, or otherwise exclusionary behaviors or, or uh, um, uh, speech. Uh, respect the privacy and safety of others. Um, um, people can, can control their privacy quite well on Slack, but we really uh, expect, for example, not to share uh, interactions that you have with other people. We expect you not to share that publicly. Be considerate of others' participation. Everyone should have an opportunity to be at least uh, uh, have their, their questions answered through Slack, if not heard. Uh, try to, to respect each other. And then use welcoming, inclusive language. Um, we expect you not to engage in exclusionary comments or jokes, threats or, or violent language are definitely not acceptable. And then if you see something that is inappropriate happening, please do speak up. Um, we have a code of conduct um, response team that is mentioned here. And if something happens during this event that requires a response from us, then please feel free to reach out either to me or to one of the other people that is mentioned here in the um, code of conduct uh, response team. Their, their Slack handles are mentioned here and you can uh, message them privately. Uh, I'd like to thank them a lot for um, volunteering to, to be part of this. Um, 
so you can reach out to me or you can reach out to one of these other people if, if you, you feel uncomfortable reaching out to me or you think that this person is better in a better position to address uh, violations of color conduct. So it's a social event and we're all gonna behave according to the code of conduct, I hope, or uh, address issues that come up related to the code of conduct together. But we'd also like to get together um, so today at 10.30, as I said, there'll be an icebreaker and there'll be a while where we'll get together um, through this uh, system called GatherTown. Uh, we'll post the link later on. Uh, GatherTown, what it does is it puts you, an avatar of you in a big map and allows you to navigate around uh, this system. And then when you come close to other people's avatars, you will show up in a video chat um, together with those people and you can talk to them. And to facilitate this icebreaker, I'll post later today uh, a few things that we'd like you to do during this icebreaker uh, so that you have something to engage with. Um, I'll post to Slack later today, both the link to Gather Town as we're ready to go in there at 10.30 Pacific time, um, and also a few sort of ideas for things uh, that we'd like you to do through this icebreaker. But this really is just an opportunity to meet other people uh, sort of face to face and talk to them. I mentioned Jissy before, this is a good way to start a conversation with other people. You're, you're birds of a feather. Uh, you can engage with them through Jitsi. Okay, now I'll go to the q and I'll just make sure that uh, things that need to be addressed in Q&A are addressed. Um, I know, so, okay. Uh, I know it's been mentioned that talks will be posted to YouTube for those who would like to go over concepts again. Which YouTube channel will be used to post them? So, um, this will be through the eScience um, YouTube channel, UW eScience, the, the institute that I'm part of. But we will also have, um, let me show this. So um, if you go to the Neuroacademy, let me go to the front page of Neuroacademy. Whoops, this is not the place we want to be. Uh, if you go to the front page and you go to courses and you go to 2020 schedule, which is the schedule for this year, and you click through on the purple, you'll see for now, it's just me and Tal's uh, faces. But once the video becomes available, the video will be embedded in this page. So you can, you can view all the, you can kind of select and view pretty easily by going to the schedule, clicking on the link to the session that you're interested in having the video right there. Uh, what should we go do if we get a 400 error at the hub when we sign in? Um, so this is, uh, we'll try to address all these things. I should mention, and I didn't mention before, there is also a Jupyter hub uh, Slack channel um, for questions about the Jupiter Hub and issues that come up with the Jupiter Hub. I will try to be able to address all these things here. Uh, I see that there's already some chatter here. Uh, if we need to get you into the access uh, control list, this is also the place to ask us to do that. Um, it looks like the days run straight through 7 3.30. Will we have any breaks, lunch times, etc.? Yes, we're, we're uh, going to try to build in breaks into things. I'm already running pretty late here, but uh, we will try to uh, build in breaks for you to move around. And we do encourage you to get up and walk every once in a while. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty dense. Um, okay, I've already posted an explanation about that. Um, and in the interest of having a break, uh, let me just uh, really thank a lot of people I mentioned ADSI before. So ADSI are, is the Algorithmic Data Science Institute at the University of Washington. And through a grant that we have from NSF, they're coming here to teach a few of the work uh, of the tutorials on Thursday. So these two tutorials, one on optimization, one on optimal uh, transport, are given by uh, researchers in the Algorithmic Data Science Institute. If you're really interested in the foundations of data science, the statistical and computational foundations of data science, the ADSI tutorials are for you, and we're really grateful that they're joining us. Uh, I should mention the fantastic instructors. We have the, the full list of instructors on the front page, and I've mentioned many of them while going over the schedule, but I'd like to, again, thank them again for um, being part of this. Uh, um, it's complicated to do anything these days, and really appreciate their uh, taking part in this. Um, Jack Van Horn um, is here, I hope, somewhere. Uh, watching this or watching other things and we'll interact with you through Slack and through other mechanisms. And he is, uh, we've, we've asked him to work as an evaluator of this course. Jack is um, um, a very distinguished uh, researcher in neuroimaging and has been really in 
big data and data science neuroimaging for a very long time. He's also one of the people who uh, facilitated the, the brain hacks as part of the OHBM um, um, conference and uh, really has been thinking about data science education and uh, data science education, biomedical imaging it, for a long time. And we've asked him to kind of take stock of what we're doing and evaluate that. So I'd like to thank him for doing that. And if he asks you questions on Slack and uh, about what your experience is like, it's because he's trying to gauge um, how, how we're doing and, and feedback to us about how this event is going, and particularly in this weird format that we're doing it this year. I'd like to uh, thank Jane Ko, who is uh, the eScience uh, program coordinator that coordinates this event and several other events. Jennifer Vo is a work study student at eScience who is helping along with some of the um, uh, logistical issues related to uploading videos and things like that. Finally, Eric Sandell has set up the Jupiter Hub and is kind of operating this Jupiter Hub, a big operation. I'd like to thank him. Um, and thank you for participating. And finally, we have to thank uh, National Institute for Mental, Mental Health, which is funding uh, Neuro Academy. We have some funding from NSF as well, as I've mentioned, and funding from the University of Washington eScience Institute, and finally, INCF for letting us use NeuroStars for this course. Uh, let me just uh, see again if there are any questions at this point. So let me go back to the Q&A and see if anything else has come up here. Um, uh, one, one thing, so I'm adding people to the hub who don't already have access. Um, just in the interest of not restarting it every five minutes, we might hold off. So if you, if you if, so please try to log in and if you can, um, then let us know ASAP because we'd like to maybe just only do like one or two more updates just so that we're not constantly restarting the hub. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll restart it, yeah, in, in about an hour or so. Uh, so please try it out now. And then if you can't get in, let us know. We'll do a few restarts. Yeah. but. Definitely let us know if you don't have access because yes. we want to make sure everyone, everyone can get it. Okay, and um, I will stop sharing and I will say that I'm looking forward to all of this and that uh, our next talk starts in eight minutes as my calendar is reminding me here. So let me take a break here. Please get up, have a drink of water, um, walk around for a little bit. And I'll see you here in eight minutes or, you know, according to wherever and whenever you're watching this. Uh, Tal, any other things we should say at this point? Yeah, I think that was it. Uh, any, right. any other questions? Well, feel free to ask at any time, either here or, or uh, in Slack. Or in Slack. Okay, that's it for me. I'll end this.